Welcome viewers to the Personal Injury Law Show. This show that talks about car accidents, work accidents, slips and falls, medical negligence. My name is Tony Carbone, Personal Injury Lawyer of over 25 years experience. With me tonight I've got Don Mafia, a Transport Accident Specialist. Good evening Don. Good evening Tony, good evening viewers. And Robert Paoletti, another car accident uh, lawyer. Thanks Tony, good to be here. Now, Tony, what's in the news? Look, there's been a lot of stories in the news, but the ones I want to do tonight, guys, are at two extremes. The first one's about hoon cars on death row. What they're going to do is, if you've been charged with hoon driving, or you get a conviction for hoon driving, your car gets put away, gets on death row, then they crush it. What do you think about that, Rob? I don't think it's that bad an idea, to be honest, because if you're going to be that irresponsible with a car, then perhaps you don't deserve to have it. And rather than giving the car back to these people who might just do this hoon driving again, it, they lose their opportunity. Don, some of these cars are worth over 50000 Wouldn't it be better to sell them off and put the money uh, to a charity or even towards some sort of a thing designed to help people that have been injured by these sorts of people? Well, I guess you don't want someone else to grab those car and do the same thing, Tony. Um, some of these cars are obviously the... Uh, been modified or something of that kind. Um, so the interesting thing there, Tony, is that these actual cars, you can actually appeal the process, and these people are not appealing it. So it gets, it gets impounded, and they just leave it there. Well, once you've been convicted, it's very hard to show that, you know, you've done nothing wrong. And once that happens, it's automatic that the car gets confiscated, and they crush it. Seems anyway. like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, All right, think... at the other extreme, and this is why I say they're two poles, uh, we're poles apart, is Roadhog Blitz. Go slow motorists are going to get fines if they're in a right-hand lane and they're not doing the speed limit. What do you think, Don? I think they should have done that years ago. In fact, the law's been around since 1999. It's only really now that they're starting to enforce it and doing this blitz, blitz on it, Tony. So uh, if you're on the right-hand side, it's just courtesy. Go to the left if you're not overtaking. Leaving aside the issue of courtesy, Don, is it unsafe to be on the right-hand lane doing under the speed limit and cars coming up behind you? I think it definitely is because when you're on the road, people assume that you'll overtake on the right and if people have to overtake on the left because they're forced to, then it puts a bit of uncertainty on the road and it just puts you in a situation where you're more likely to have accidents. And plus, doesn't it throw the whole road into chaos? You've got drivers going fast on the inside lanes, drivers on the outside lanes going slow. It just turns the whole place upside down. There's so no, there's no order to it, guys. that's the problem. Like I said, I mean, this has been around. The law's been enforced since 1999. It's only now they're trying to uh, do this police blitz on it. So, look, hopefully, hopefully now it would reduce the number of accidents on the roads that's been caused by these road hogs. And hopefully, Tony, it, it, once this is enforced and once it's been in, implemented, um, there's not as many accidents. And it should work too, because this is a given fact in many countries around the world that you just go to the left when you're driving slowly and you overtake on the right. Simple well, as that. Well, the right-hand lane's designed to overtake. That's right. Correct? That's right. And just lastly. We've got the story of that young lady, Casey Hardiman, who was driving along the Surf Coast Highway and a fellow in front has lost his pot plants. She swerves to miss him and she dies. She goes onto the other side of the road. Incredibly and sad story, Tony. It just goes to show how important it is for loads to be secured when you're on the road because you just never know what's going to happen. Apparently the police said they couldn't charge him with anything more serious. Personally, I think it was criminal negligence, which um, would have warranted a manslaughter charge. But he got charged and got a fine of $1,000, Don. Well, the magistrate did say it was a lapse of judgment. Um, so there wasn't any malice involved, it was just a lapse in judgment. He didn't properly secure the load on his trailer. Um, it's a very, very tragic circumstances. And the magistrate was in tears when she imposed the maximum penalty, which was $1,000. Yeah, but at the end of the day, surely it's foreseeable, Rob, that if you don't secure a load, the worst that can happen is someone can get killed. You would think that it would be, and it just really comes, it's like Don says, just a tragic situation that a person who probably didn't have any malice at all just had an oversight and it caused very, very... Just... Yeah, but the laws of criminal negligence doesn't entail malice. It just entails gross negligence. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Look, I, look, I understand, Tony, but unfortunately in these circumstances, I mean, both, both parties, I mean, he, he's got to live with this for the rest of his life. And he was in, and there was many witnesses that presented at the, at the hearing we were just saying he was a good character person, which is just one of those laps of judgments which has led oh. to very tragic circumstances. All I know is that Matthew Broadhead is very lucky he's not in jail. That's my no, view. No. Viewers, tonight our topic of discussion is rear-end collisions. Now, the reason why it's important is because there could be a multi-car pile-up and you need to show which impact has caused the damage for you to be compensated. 
And in any event, it's also important from the point of view of property damage because you might be an uninsured vehicle and if you can't prove that someone else has run into the back of you first or whatever, or what caused the damage, you're going to have significant issues about who's to pay. Now, on that note, let's go to the first case of Leventris and Terry. Can you give us some facts on that, Yeah, sure, Tony. In this case, Mrs Leventris was driving her car along a freeway, uh, sorry, a, a highway, and she was driving behind you know, a line of traffic. She stopped at a traffic light, and relevantly, there were two cars ahead of her. Now, the traffic light turned green, the cars proceeded to go through the intersection, but then a taxi pulled into the lane and overtook a car, causing the line of traffic to come to a halt. Now, meanwhile, behind, Mrs. Terry was uh, driving her car, didn't see that the traffic was stopping and then drove into the back of Mrs. Levin Terrace. Now this is where the facts get a bit shady because Mrs. Levin Terrace believes that she was hit by Mrs. Terry from behind and then she was pushed into the car in front, whereas Mrs. Terry says that Mrs. Levin Terrace already hit the car in front before she hit her. There was a lot of conjecture there, wasn't there, Don? There was. There was a lot of evidence that was uncertain yeah. and, you know, it's very complicated to reconstruct an accident like that, isn't it, uh, Don? Well, well, it is. In this case, the, the witness, the driver of the car in front of Mrs Leventeris, the plaintiff, she actually said she heard two bangs. So she heard one bang and then another bang. So that, that, and, and that coupled with what the defendant driver was saying, that there was an accident that already occurred, the judge found that the plaintiff had actually ran into the car in front and then the defendant ran into the plaintiff's car. Um, so that was ultimately what the judge held. And they went through a lot of evidence there, Tony. They went through, they had expert evidence and all that, and they, they, all the expert evidence came back to say that there was two collisions. Mrs. The plaintiff hit the car in front and then the defendant hit the plaintiff's car after the collision. Now, this has a tragic uh, sequel to it. Mrs. Oliventris didn't survive. She died before she did. the she judge was, made a decision. She was an elderly lady and unfortunately she passed away before judgment was handed down. However, fortunately for her estate, the, she was successful in getting some damages because it was proved that although she had actually hit the car in front before the other vehicle hit her, the second collision from behind was the heavier collision and they decided that was ultimately what caused her injuries. But the estate only got paid gratuitous services. The estate didn't get anything for pain and suffering done. No, no, it didn't. Uh, according to the laws of South Australia, I believe that is prevented if the, uh, if the person dies before the judgment is entered. But even in Victoria, assuming someone died before a judgment was handed down, the estate can only get pain and suffering for the individual up to the date of death. Yeah. And the thing is, you've got to get more than a threshold, which is 50000 yeah. Isn't That's that correct? Right. That's correct. That's correct. Now, do you think it was a good decision, Rob? Look, I think ultimately the judge came to the right decision in finding that although there was an accident that occurred, a collision prior to the relevant one, really the important one was the collision from behind and Mrs Terry unfortunately should have been paying more attention. Viewers, we've got to go to the sponsors break, so please stay tuned. We'll go to some more cases when we get back.